Welcome back, everyone. In this video, I'm going to discuss a method of rabbinic interpretation that I've talked about in other videos as well. To review how this method works, let's first begin with a humorous parody. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. But read this dictionary entry very carefully. Notice, pig can mean to eat something quickly. He pigged three donuts and ran off to school. And here in the U.S., we say that people who eat too much pig out. So let's return to our story. Since pig can refer to a person who pigs out on too many donuts, this story could actually be interpreted as follows. Once upon a time, there were three little people who ate way too many donuts. But that's not how the story goes. We determine a word's meaning from its context. And in the context of the story of the three little pigs, it's not referring to people who eat donuts. With all due respect to our Jewish friends, much of rabbinic exegesis isn't a whole lot better. Here's another example to add to what we've discussed in previous videos. Notice that Genesis 8.1 and Esther 7.10 use the same Hebrew words for subsided. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king subsided. The word used for wrath in Esther 7.10 can also mean heat, as you see in Hosea 7.5 and Ezekiel 3.14. Now, watch carefully. Since the same Hebrew word for subsided occurs in both Esther 7.10 and Genesis 8.1, you can interpret those passages together. And since Chema in Esther 7.10 can sometimes mean heat, you can read that into Genesis 8.1 and say that the heat of the waters subsided. So that is the basis for the rabbi's interpretation that the people in Noah's flood were judged with boiling liquid. With boiling liquid they sinned, and with boiling liquid they were judged. Are the rabbis trying to write history with these stories? No, they're not. They're reading things into the text like they do so frequently. But these sorts of stories do tend to take on a life of their own. By the time we get to the Quran, they are history. And Allah is the one giving rabbinic exegesis life by his own command. The Quran employs a word that means to boil. For those who disbelieve in their Lord, there is the punishment of Gehenna, and it is an evil homecoming. When they are cast into it, they will hear its panting as it boils up. And how do you boil water? With an oven, of course. Until when our command came and the oven boiled, we said, load into it two of every kind, a pair and your family, except for the one against whom the word has already gone forth, and whoever has believed, but only a few had believed with him. So we inspired him, build the ship under our eyes and our inspiration. And when our command comes and the oven boils, put into it two of every kind, a pair, and your family, except for him against whom the word has already gone forth. Do not address me concerning those who have done evil. Surely they are going to be drowned. Note that the loan word the Quran uses for oven corresponds closely to the Hebrew and Aramaic words, which also mean oven. Arthur Jeffrey notes that this word means oven in old poetry as well. I'm stressing this because some translations, like Yusuf Ali's, are clearly lacking when they say that the fountains of the earth gushed forth. So the ovens boiled and heated the floodwaters of judgment in the Talmud and later in the Quran. Once again, rabbinic exegesis becomes history in the Quran. The boiling motif is elevated from a literary device in the Talmud to something that actually happened at the command of Allah. Thanks for watching.